All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're just going to let folks filter in for a few more seconds, and then we're going to jump to it. Seeing who's filing in here. Welcome, everybody. So exciting to have you with us. Um, so as you as you're all coming in, um, I just like to start by um, briefly orienting you to the, the zoom functionality. Um, some of you are likely familiar with zoom by this time, but we just want to support you in um, best navigating the tools on this webinar. And then after that, I'll go into the brief introductions to the speakers and the flow of the workshop. Um, so uh, my colleague Megan Fowler is here. She's your tech support today. Um, and, and please send her a private chat if you're having any technical issues or if you need any further direct support throughout the call. Um, so just to orient you a little bit to the tools, um, on the far left there is the mute button. Um, so we're keeping everyone muted here for the main presentation just to keep it a little less chaotic, but you'll have the opportunity to chat during the breakout groups um, where you can mute, uh, mute yourself there. Uh, the start video button, um, we encourage you if you're comfortable to turn on your video so we can all see your beautiful faces and for networking purposes. Uh, the participants button there um, allows you to view who the other participants are um, on the call. The chat button, uh, this one's really important. Um, we encourage you to uh, click that open. Um, the moderators will be sharing links and information with the, with the whole group in the chat. So um, try to pop that open right now if you can. And you can use that chat box to pose um, any questions or comments that you have throughout the presentation. And we're gonna do our very best to, to get to everyone's questions uh, during the Q&A section of the agenda later. And also to point out, there's a little dropdown um, that allows you to chat to everyone, which will go to the whole group or just privately to an individual. Uh, the uh, recording, so this main presentation is being recorded um, and we're gonna be making that available on American Farmland Trust website, along with the resource handout that you um, should have received earlier today. And um, just to mention that the breakout groups that we're gonna go into later will not be recorded. Um, and then, um, um, you know, we hope you'll stay on for the full 90 minutes. We have, we have tapped these presentations at an intimate uh, group of people, so, um, but we understand if for any reason um, you have to leave the leave button was there on the, on the previous screen. And then lastly, um, polls. We're going to be running a few polls uh, throughout the webinar today just to gauge where the audience is at and keep you guys all on your toes. So um, here's the first poll question. So just uh, take a quick minute to fill it out. Um, now we're just trying to get a sense of, of who's in the room, uh, where you guys are coming from, and the kind of organization that you represent. Great. So as those are, are filling in, um, uh, if you could just go to the next slide real quick, Megan. Um, I'll, I'll get back to your poll answers in a second, but I just wanted to, to, to really, um, since we've got the, the, the Zoom intro out of the way, I just want to really extend a, a formal welcome now um, to you all for coming to the first webinar of the Farms for the Future project, uh, supporting and sustaining farms, farmers, and farmland in your community. Uh, my name is Jamie Potter, and I'm the New England Program Manager at American Farmland Trust, and I'll be your MC for the next 90 minutes. Um, so uh, just looking at, at the poll results, um, those are, are still coming in, but it looks like we've got about um, sort of half and half municipal folks, um, land trust volunteer or staff, and, and a couple um, nonprofit uh, service provider folks. So it's great to get a sense of, of who's here in the room. Thanks for, for filling that out. Um, so a little bit about the, the workshop series. Um, this was created through the partnership and, and really incredible organizing efforts of um, some of the following people. Um, so my colleague Megan Fowler and myself at, at AFT, Stephanie Morningstar at the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, um, who you'll meet today, as well as Meg Quinn at Maine Farm Land Trust, Jeremy McGee at Southeast Land Trust of New Hampshire, and Nancy Everhart at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And this project has been generously funded by Jane's Trust. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so we're joined today by some really wonderful guest speakers, some true powerhouses in the field of, of agriculture and land protection in our region. We're so excited to have them on today. Uh, Julia Free Good, my colleague at AFT, she's our Arms for a New Generation Director and Senior Advisor. Uh, Stephanie Morningstar, who's the executive director at the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, and Ellen Griswold, who's the policy and research director 
at Maine Farmland Trust. Um, we're so excited to, to have you all in today. Um, and so as I'm sure is the case for um, a lot of projects that you all are, are undertaking in your communities right now, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted this project in many ways. Um, it's required our planning team to adapt what were originally to be in-person workshops into this virtual format. Uh, so do bear with us as we lean into this technology. Um, but it's also really brought into sharp relief the strengths and weaknesses of our local food systems here in Northern New England. And there really seems to be this growing interest and awareness of the critical role that local farms and farmers play in community resilience and well-being, um, and a real desire for more skills and training for how to affect change at the local level, and especially how to advance uh, greater land and racial justice. Um, so this webinar is the first in a five-part series of educational workshops that we've designed uh, specifically for land trusts, municipalities, and, and other nonprofits and service providers um, in Maine and in the other New England, northern New England states um, who would like to better understand how to support farms and farmers in their communities. And each workshop um, will offer some core content, some state-specific tools and resources, Q&A section, and networking opportunities. And each workshop also builds off of the previous one. Um, and we really encourage you to try to attend as many of these in the series as possible, or to, to try to catch up if you miss it and, and watch the recordings of each one, um, which we will make available on our website. Um, so today's workshop will offer sort of a broad overview of principles and tools for developing more farm-friendly communities. And it's, it's followed over the next five weeks, um, uh, starting next week with um, strategies and tools for farm protection, a whole workshop on solar siting and farmland the week after that, um, making farmland available to farmers. And then the last workshop is a deep dive into tools and resources for supporting Black, Indigenous, and farmers of color in your community. Um, and we'll go over the dates of these, uh, these and other upcoming workshops um, at the end of this presentation. Um, but so as we all navigate the um, topic of land policy and land justice in this learning space together, we just want to invite you to, to really be um, inquisitive while open to others' perspectives and worldviews. Um, we encourage you to be as present as possible in listening and engaging during these 90 minutes, but we also just want you to be comfortable. So make sure, you know, get up, get a cup of coffee or tea, whatever you need that helps you focus. Um, this is a morning presentation, um, so we've all got our coffee here. Um, and you know, our hope is that through listening and learning in this space, uh, we will all leave today with a, a commitment to continue learning and taking some concrete actions to advance this critical work in our communities. Um, so the last thing I'll say as I, as I hand it off to our presenters is just a quick overview of the agenda. Um, you'll hear first today from Steph Morningstar from Northeast Farmers of Color Lantra. She's gonna briefly frame some of the complex and difficult realities around uh, land dispossession of indigenous communities and people of color farmers here in New England. Um, and this frame of reference is really vital to our work and our planning team and speakers will be weaving this topic and farmer voices um, into the workshops that follow in the series. Um, Julia Friedgood will then provide an overview of some of the ongoing threats to land in Maine and messaging tools and principles you can use when advocating for farm-friendly communities. Um, Ellen Griswold is then going to give us a deeper dive into some specific tools for advancing this work here in Maine. Um, we'll then have a Q&A with all of the speakers, followed by a short breakout group activity, and um, quick report back from the facilitators before we try to wrap it up um, right at 1130. So we have a full, full suite of activities ahead of us. Um, and so without further ado, um, we're going to play a short video um, with some remarks from Seth Morningstar. And I just want to note that this video is part of a larger presentation that we'll be sharing in later webinars in the series. So we encourage you to come back for more detailed historical context and more specifics about the work of me folk um, in our region. So Megan, if you could tee up that video, we can get that going. Oh, 
How's it going there, Megan? Bear with us, folks. Thank you. Sorry, I was playing it. I didn't realize it wasn't. Um, I'm going to quit sharing my screen for two seconds and reshare it again, and then we'll pick back up. OK, thanks, Megan. Um, because there has, and this is, oh, yeah, there you go. Great. Greetings, everybody. It's Stephanie Morningstar, Executive Director of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. We're here today to um, present to you some brief information about the history of land dispossession and racism in the U.S. Um, it's important for us, before we begin talking about land, to talk about the history of the land that we all occupy. Now, I know that this may not seem like this is something that applies to you or applies to your particular land trust or service organization. But if you think about it, um, you know, maybe you think, well, all farmers matter or, you know, we don't have any farmers of color in our community, so this doesn't really apply to us. Well, I'm going to push back a bit on that um, because there has, and this is one of the ways that we're going to illustrate why Yes, all farmers matter, but, it, you know, there are reasons for why some farmers are not getting a fair shake in this world or in, in this community or in this quote unquote industry. And um, there's a, a history of dispossession of land and racism that we really do need to be aware of while we're working with um, the land itself, as well as knowing that the lands that we occupy have a very specific history that we have to pay attention to. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to deliver a message. I'm here to share the work that we do. I'm here to share one of the reasons for, or some of the reasons for why we do the work we do. And if we're working on land, then I think it's, you know, it's important for us to understand the history of those lands. So the map that you're looking at is a map of the Northeast and you would see, you can see the Great Lakes here and you can see all of these blobs of color and they're all overlapping and it's kind of an interesting, unique look, looking um, map. What this is, is it's a map called the Native Land Map and this is a map that shows the, um, the territory that we serve, the Northeast part of the United States. Only it doesn't look like the Northeast part of the United States right here, it looks somewhat different and the reason it looks different is because these areas here are all different indigenous territories and you can see that they overlap somewhat and um, that they, they don't have any defining state line boundaries or anything like that. Um, so this is the area that we all currently occupy and um, the area that many of us are serving. So ultimately, the reason for why we're here today and the reason for why the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust exists is because 98% of land in the United States, farmland in the United States, is currently controlled by white landowners. And as um, one of our founding NEFOC Network members, Leah Penniman, author of Farming Law Black, says, this is not an accident of history. And as you can see in that very, very brief rundown with this timeline, that history can show you very very clearly the systems that were put in place in order to dispossess people of land. How is this affecting us today? Well, um, you know, nearly 100% of the farmland in the Northeast is owned by white folks. Um, we have a very um, tenuous relationship with land leasing and being able to um, achieve permanent and secure land tenure. In addition to that, we also, as um, people of color, carry something called comorbidities. And um, because of the level of stress and the poverty and um, disenfranchisement that we've been, um, experienced over the years, that's also affected our bodies. In fact, um, right now with COVID-19 happening, black folks make up 34% of COVID-related deaths, um, but only make up 13.4% of the population. And um, 
33% of black folks actually require hospitalization due to co these comorbidities and chronic illnesses due to inequity in the food system. So this is why we exist and this is why we're here and this is a, just a quick peek at a very small portion of the group that um, forms the Northeast Farmers of Color and our network and our land trust. And um, we're going to be presenting throughout these webinar series. So um, this was just a quick a quick brief peek at um, some of the reasons for why we do the work that we do and to give you an idea of maybe some of the reasons or some of the things that you need to think about when you're um, working on land or with land, um, whether or not you work with Black Indigenous POC farmers, just to understand a little bit more about the history of land dispossession as it's related to the Department of Agriculture um, and just land dispossession in general. I think we just feel like it's very important for you to understand that. So it'll frame up a bit more about our work and our um, what calls us to action. And I really appreciate you hearing us today. For more information, you can go to nefolklandtrust.org. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can get in touch at connect at nefolklandtrust.org. Uh, thank you so much, Steph, um, for that really powerful video, and we're excited to have you back um, on many of the upcoming workshops. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Julia Friedgood from American Farmland Trust to uh, wow us with some powerful data about the state of agriculture in Maine. Welcome, Julia. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jamie, and um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, in, in particular, Steph, um, for giving that long view of, of, of land in general, but also to keep in mind the history of land dispossession because it, it really is important for the context of all of the work that we're doing. I'm going to give a brief overview of, of the status of Maine's farms, farmers, and farmland in the short view, in the 21st century, so very short view, um, and then share some thoughts on why saving farmland is important, um, principles and practices to help you think about how you create farm-friendly communities, and I think, Megan, there might be a poll that we start off with here to get your input on, on sort of what your top three reasons are for saving farmland. Uh, this workshop is the first in a series of five, so I'm going to be pretty general and give a pretty broad overview, and then hope you'll join us for future workshops, which will dig down deeper, as, as Jamie has said, into specific issues and concerns. We'll give you a, a second to fill this out, and then that will help me actually shorten up because I know we're running late, and um, I'll probably need to shorten up as I go along. So, so this is really interesting. Um, quite different actually from the results in New Hampshire, except that food security, food sovereignty ended up on top in both. But, um, and I think that there's maybe a little bit of a, a, a wider range of responses here in Maine and that's exciting to hear about. I also hope that you can hear me because for some reason there's a big airplane going over me right now. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, next slide, Megan. Right, so this map um, really is, it's coming out of our recent work called Farms Under Threat, the State of the States. Um, we released our report this spring and the map on the left shows kind of the status of farmland conversion in Maine. It's the relationship between higher quality farmland, which is shown in green, and then conversion um, and the sort of long-term threat of conversion that's shown in red. Um, and, it, and the conversion we're looking at are two types, so to urban and highly developed, but also to low density residential. And you can, you can see sort of where the clustering is happening as everybody would expect more in Southern Maine. Um, but you also can see some up in Northern Maine in the midst of, of some of the finest farmland actually in the country. Um, in the other map on the right side, what you see is how much land has been protected. And, and this is actually a new data layer that we're just working on. So it's not perfect or complete, but it does show the percent of 
acres protected and compared to our farms under threat data on land. Um, Maine Department of Ag reports about just under 10,000 acres have been protected permanently by the state program through the end of 2019. But then there's a lot of additional data showing that land trusts, like Maine Farm Land Trust, have protected at least another 40,000 acres. And we're still vetting this to ensure that it's accurate. We may be missing some protected farmland. And if any of you are from land trusts and want to participate in this, um, we're, we're actually going to the people to gather the data from their own records. But all told, about 3% of Maine's ag land has been permanently protected. And so the thing on the bottom is just to sort of say, this is how many acres were converted from 2001 to 2016, which is the period of farms under threat. And then these are the number of acres that have been protected forever over the life of all of the farmland protection programs in Maine. So as part of farms under threat, next slide, Meg. Thank you, Megan. Um, we also looked at state policies and conducted um, research on them and created this thing we call the Ag Land Protection or ALP scorecard. And this chart on top kind of shows how Maine stacks up. And on the bottom, you see that you have basically a medium threat of conversion. You've had a medium policy response. We looked at six main policies that are, have been enacted in at least 10 states. And so from this, it's clear that you know, you're doing a, a bit above, of, above median in purchase of ag conservation easements or development rights, state authority for land use planning, property tax relief for your current use program. You don't have an ag districts program. You actually have a private uh, farm link program, not a public one that, so you don't get a score for that, um, but it doesn't matter. And then you have some state leasing, which you could probably do a better job. We don't expect anybody to have everything. Um, I think the most important thing is that people look at what they have and make sure they're doing as well as they can with the programs that are in place and then figure out if there's anything more they need to do to solve their problems. So next slide. This one is just really, if you wanna learn more and dig in deeper, we usually do like an hour and a half presentation on that. So if you want more, um, go to our website, call us for information. We're happy to help you dig down in and, and really explore our findings. So the next thing, so that's farmland conversion, that's a big threat, um, but what affects farmland conversion often is economics. And Maine's farms um, are struggling to survive as most farms are across the country. Um, this you know, kind of gives you kind of the high level data, 64% um, had net losses according to the census of ag in 2017. Um, Maine is not immune from the forces affecting agriculture across the country, especially consolidation, which has taken its toll on, nope, you can stay there, Megan, thanks, yeah, which has taken its toll on small and mid-sized commercial operations, and that's most of what happens in New England, um, actually most of what happens across the country. So over the course of the 20th century, that consolidation um, meant that farms declined by more than 60%, while average farm size increased 67%. And ag became increasingly mechanized and specialized with wealth concentrated on fewer and fewer larger and larger farms. So that today, half of all US ag production comes from farms grossing a million or more, which is a 20% 20 20 increase from just the 1990s. And now we can go to the next one, which gives the chart of sort of Maine. And so this is just kind of showing where Maine stands now by market share. And what you see, it's actually incredibly, it's very symmetrical, um, where there's this preponderance of very small farms. Um, and if you look actually at the very smallest and then the next category, so up to 50,000, it's about 80% of the farms are grossing less than $50,000 a year. And yet 2% of the farms that are grossing more than a million dollars a year account for 60% of market value. So just as with the nation, consolidation in Maine's ag has been increasing steadily. Million dollar farms have contributed to more and more of the state's ag revenue, just from 40% in 2002 to over 60% in, the, in today's census. So farms in the middle have contributed less and less overall, continue to get squeezed, and I think is where we need to spend a lot of our attention actually because um, they control a lot of our ag land. So the hope is, the next slide, 
is that there are areas where things are growing and becoming increasingly prosperous and local food markets is one of them. And so today about a third of Maine farms have direct to consumer or DTC and intermediated market sales. So intermediated market sales are the food hubs and institutions and restaurants and so on. Um, direct to consumer have tripled um, it, you know, basically in this century, and then the intermediated have a really strong economic impact. So expanding these opportunities requires planning and foresight, and, and it will require more infrastructure and, con and cultivating community support for agriculture. Meeting demand from these markets requires more land, more farmers, and more farmers are going to have to balance the challenges and opportunities of farming in metro and adjacent counties and where you see a lot of this low density residential development spreading across the countryside. So let's go to the next one. So I think that's some hope. Um, the other thing that we have to contend with is kind of a demographic shift. Um, I think most people are aware that farmers are aging faster than the general population. Um, it's not so much that the average age is creeping up, but the proportion of retirement age farmers keeps outstripping the ranks of young and beginning producers. So this, trend, this map kind of shows that trend nationally. We circled the, the northern New England states we're talking about in this webinar, um, with the darkest red showing more than five times as many old to young, so that's over 65 to under 35, and then the, the pale color being two to three times as many. Um, Maine is somewhat in the middle of the spectrum with nearly three and a half times as many producers age 65 and over than under 35, representing about a third of the state's farmers. And about 60% of its farms report involvement in succession planning, a new thing that was in the census this year or a couple of years ago, covering about two thirds of the state's ag land acres, but still leaving about 450,000 acres unplanned for. Okay, next. So why save farmland? And, and you gave a very well distributed um, answer to that. So um, clearly this is a really high priority for, for you folks in Maine. Um, I didn't mean to, to paint a dire picture, um, but the threats to farms, farmers and farmland are real and growing. Um, so we're, we're assuming that you're participating because you care and I can see you do. Um, why don't we just go to the next slide, Megan? Um, you know, broadly, the U.S. has, you know, the highest or the most abundance of arable land on Earth. Um, but the world population is growing, our population gr is growing, New England's population is growing. Um, and so we really need to, to treat it like the treasure that it is. Next slide. We need to be prepared. And so these are some of the reasons that we, we believe that it's important to save farmland. Um, I can see that, that you agree. Um, I think climate is one of the new ones that is sort of on the list, so I'll speak to it for a minute. Um, some research that we did in California shows that, that, GHG, that there are far fewer GHG emissions from ag land than land that's converted to development or housing or commercial use. We did this greener field study that found farmland converted to other uses emits greenhouse gases at a level sometimes as high as 70% greater than it had been in farming. But when it's managed with good management practices or regenerative practice, it can help combat climate change. And then I think there are other things. I think the food security sovereignty issue is really important. And, and I think at AFT, we're really focused on the sovereignty part, which takes it beyond food security, which is um, you know, just incidents of hunger or lack of food and access and really looks at more of the ethical dimensions and also making sure that that land is well cared for. And there are gonna be more webinars on renewable energy and solar. So I'm gonna sort of skip over some of these because I got my time warning um, and go to the next slide um, about creating farm friendly communities. And let's just go, yeah, that's good. So, you know, basically, I know that a lot of people when they filled out their surveys about what they wanted to learn said there are a lot of plans and they sit on shelves and we don't wanna just plan. But I would say that if you don't plan, you're gonna fail, <laughs> that we have to look ahead. Um, and so there's sort of planning in the larger context of what public planning process is. Um, 
And most communities don't plan for agriculture. Maine does a better job than most communities, but it still is something that I think we need to be really proactive about. So next slide. I'm ripping through these now. Um, what I think is really important is the principles of it. A lot of people talk about best practices, but I work nationally and those practices can change from place to place. So we really focus on principles, taking a systems approach, but really to sort of build on what Steph was talking about is how do we really involve all the people who are involved in the policies that we're creating in the process of creating those policies. And so for agriculture, that in, includes farmers and farmers often get left out of planning processes, but it means also farmers of color and being very intentional about that process. We also think you should take a community asset approach and not a problem solving approach. And then finally, and, and this is how you prevent your plan from just sitting on a shelf and gathering dust, is to plan with implementation in mind. So those are the principles. This is kind of the process. I think that um, in, in the interest of time, I won't spend much time on this, but a lot of planning processes are kind of linear and we envision this as a much more circular or even spiraling process. So engagement has to be built into all elements of it, not just in the visioning that starts at the beginning, not just in collecting surveys to see what your community thinks, but really, especially when you get to the generating the recommendations for policies and implementing them. Um, obviously, you need to base that on good data and you need good data and metrics to make sure that once you started implementing, you're actually achieving your goals because you probably need to adjust and go through this process, not necessarily in a linear order, but in, in a sort of spiraling way going forward. And so, next one. So when we think about planning for agriculture, um, there are kind of four buckets that we tend to focus on. There could be five, there could be six, but basically four. So protecting farmland, and there's gonna be a whole webinar on that. Supporting ag development and really looking at the fiscal and economic impacts of ag. Promoting good conservation, which often gets left out, and then creating community connections broadly defined. And so I'm just gonna, run through these really fast. Um, so protecting farmland in, in Maine, one of the main tools that you have is protecting it with permanently with purchase of ag conservation easements or development rights. Um, at the town level, it can be really hard to come up with the money that you need. But by having everybody work together, municipalities, working with the state, leveraging federal funds and working with land trusts, especially in Maine, working with land trusts, um, you can get a lot done. I think it's really important to address farmland as a, a desired land use in your comp plan. Um, I would ask you all to question, do you know if it is in your comp plan? And if so, is there a real ag purpose statement there? Uh, planning to create sort of an ag commission. Um, there are lots of things that you can do. Um, and I, I know that, that I'm gonna be followed up um, with, with sort of an in-state in, in perspective on this. So we'll move ahead a little bit and then look at supporting ag development. And here I think it's really important in your planning and zoning ordinances to make sure that you have flexible um, policies so that you allow things like agritourism, um, marketing and value added processing. Um, I love this picture because it's a, a local farm around me where they have, they have a, a dairy farm and then they use ag viability funds to, to do ice cream and have a farm stand that sells ice cream. And that's really been a great way to keep them in business. So they're still dairy farmers. Um, I'm just at time, I need to wrap, okay. So marketing and promotion support, um, as I said before, really important to build in conservation when you're thinking about protecting ag in the future and planning for it. And then finally, creating community connections. And one of the main things I think is reducing conflicts between farmers and neighbors, but also leasing space for farming. Um, that could be community farms, it could be for beginning farmers, um, and then supporting direct-to-consumer marketing and farm-to-institution and those kinds of things. And with that, I'm at time, so I'm gonna wrap. Thank you very much. Um, feel free to get in touch for any more information.
That's great. Thank you so much, Julia. Such a font of information. I could listen to you all day. Um, but we have to transition now to our esteemed guest, Ellen Griswold from Maine Farmland Trust, who's going to dig into some of the policy um, and planning landscape for Maine. So welcome, Ellen. Great. Thanks so much, um, Jamie, and thanks so much to everyone for having me um, here today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ellen Griswold, and I'm the Policy and Research Director at Maine Farmland Trust. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so hopefully you're all familiar with Maine Farmland Trust, but we're a member-powered statewide organization that works to protect farmland, support farmers, and advance the future of farming. Um, since 1999, MFT has helped to permanently protect nearly 300 farms and keep over 60,000 acres of farmland in farming while supporting over 800 farm families with a range of services. Um, our main program areas are farmland protection, and you'll be hearing more about that um, on a subsequent workshop. Um, farm viability, which is sort of business planning and technical assistance um, to help farmers become and remain economically viable. Um, and then policy and outreach to really grow the future of farming, um, especially in the face of, of climate change. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, so we at Maine Farmland Trust, and I think um, this is true of many partners across the state, really feel like Maine has a lot of the needed ingredients to have a really ag active and vibrant agricultural sector. Um, some of those ingredients are listed there. Um, but we believe that municipalities play a really important role in making that potential a reality. Um, and we really depend upon communities in Maine um, thinking through and instituting farm-friendly um, policies and, and planning processes, and um, talk a little bit more about that. Um, the next slide, please. <clears throat> so I was asked just to you know, provide a little bit of an overview of some important recent developments for agriculture in Maine. Um, and to Julia's point about the importance, sort of increasing importance of climate change, um, I want to talk a little bit about Maine's Climate Council process. Um, so I was part of the Natural and Working Lands Working Group, um, which for the last year was charged with making recommendations related to agriculture, forestry, and natural lands um, to the Maine Climate Council um, for the purpose of updating the state's climate action plan. And we as a working group um, really acknowledge the important role that farms play in terms of both climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, in addition to a lot of other really important co-benefits, um, including um, increases in water quality and quantity, other ecosystem services, um, increases in farmer profitability. Um, and so the working group was really focused on thinking through what kind of financial, technical, and research assistance we can be providing to farmers um, across the state to be using practices that create these um, benefits and co-benefits. Um, and I think that there is a really important role for municipalities to play um, in carrying through that work, um, particularly through land use planning and some of the municipal tax programs um, that I'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a minute. Um, I also wanted to note, um, and this is again another topic that um, will be explored more in a subsequent webinar, but um, solar development on agricultural land has become a big topic in the last year. Legislation was passed um, last year that really opened the door to a lot more um, solar electrical generation within the state. Um, and we saw a ton of solar developers coming to the state looking for um, sites for solar projects, including on agricultural land near transmission infrastructure. Um, and I, you know, I always like to say from the get-go that Maine Farmland Trust really believes that solar energy production and agricultural production can coexist in a really um, mutually beneficial manner, and that um, solar projects can be a really important source of income for farms because um, as we saw, many farms are struggling economically within the state. Um, but we also believe that it's really important to be thinking through the planning processes and the policies that are needed just to ensure that there's the right balance between those two because we do wanna make sure that, um, you know, that solar development is creating sort of benefits for farms but not displacing agricultural production or um, eliminating land that many farmers rely on, um, particularly leased land 
um, for their farming operations. And so even though that will be explored um, later on, I did just want to note that that was a big development. Um, and Maine Farmland Trust, along with many partners, some of whom are on this call, have really been um, working with solar developers and environmental organizations and other ag support groups over the course and municipal officials um, over the course of the last year to really think through what is the right sort of what are the best practices and what are um, sources of guidance that we can be providing. Um, and, you know, it would be really hard to talk about um, recent developments in agriculture without talking about um, COVID-19 um, because obviously the um, pandemic has had a tremendous impact on um, farms and agriculture across the state. Um, you know, necessary measures to contain the virus have basically caused um, markets for many farmers um, to dry up practically overnight. Um, while other farmers who were doing more direct to consumer sales or were able to quickly pivot more to direct to consumer sales have seen more stabilized markets or even seen their markets grow. Um, but certainly all farmers within the state are having to contend with the increased costs um, associated with the you know, health and safety precautions. Um, and in addition to sort of the impacts on um, labor that we've been seeing um, during the last couple months. And you know, this, this sort of relates to um, some of the benefits that Julia um, touched upon before. Um, the impact on farms is, a, is an issue across, across the state, for everyone in the state, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, you know, agriculture is a really important part of Maine's economy. Um, Farm Credit East does an economic impact analysis of um, agriculture in different Northeast states. Um, they're currently working on one based on the 2017 Ag Census, but the last one that they did based on the 2012 Census showed that um, agriculture contributes almost $3.8 billion in statewide total sales and supports over 24,000 jobs in the, in the state. Um, and as it relates to municipalities, I think many of us on, on this call understand that farms are often the economic backbone of rural communities across the state, um, creating food and jobs, not just on the farm, but in supporting other um, support industries like veterinarians and feed stores and um, equipment dealers. Um, and so what happens to farms in those communities has sort of um, ripple effects. Um, for other sectors within or other people and families within those communities as well. Um, and farms are an important part of our tourism industry, which is a big um, industry within Maine, um, you know, both in terms of the agritourism um, events that Julia referred to previously, um, and just in terms of creating the pastoral beauty of the state that is a big draw for many visitors. Um, I think this pandemic, though, has also uh, um, really highlighted the importance of local and regional um, food security and food sovereignty um, as consumers across the state have seen, uh, particularly earlier on in the pandemic, some of the supply chain disruptions. Um, and I think it was just sort of a wake up call about um, the need to sort of support local farms. Um, that was why sort of um, support for development of the local and regional food system was actually part of the one of the recommendations coming out of the natural and working lands working group um, just out of recognition that with climate change we will see more um, supply chain disruptions as well and we need to make sure that we're um, prepared for that and that we have a robust um, local and regional food system to counteract that um, and then i just wanted to also say it this pandemic really underscored the importance of high-speed internet access across the state um, you know, Maine farm businesses um, have needed to increase their online business activities because of the pandemic or have had to pivot to using more online platforms. Maine farm families have needed access um, to high speed internet for their families um, and uh, for, you know, education and connectivity. Um, but I did want to note a highlight. Um, was that in July, um, voters across Maine supported a $15 million bond um, to invest in high-speed internet infrastructure um, that'll be matched by $30 million in private and federal support. And it relates to communities because with the use of these funds, Connect Maine will be providing important community planning grants uh, to communities across the state to plan for and invest in this important infrastructure. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so these are the stakeholders that are often involved in creating farm-friendly communities. Um, I'm not gonna go into them in the interest of time and detail, um, but I will be talking about the guide, municipal guide that uh, Maine Farmland Trust put together um, in 2011, along with American Farmland Trust that we're in the process of updating right now. And that guide provides a lot of information um, on these um, different stakeholders. Um, next slide, please. Um, but, you know, like Julia, I really want to um, emphasize the important group of stakeholders that should always be included um, in thinking through farm friendly policies and planning processes and that's the farmers in your community. Um, farmers in your communities obviously understand um, the needs of their businesses better than anyone, um, as well as the potential threats um, and needed um, course changes um, to help them um, thrive. Um, Agricultural commissions can be a good way to do that. There are advisory bodies that are focused strictly on agricultural issues and can really serve as the voice of agriculture um, in policy development and planning processes. There are only a few that exist in Maine, um, but it's a very common practice in other um, states in New England. Um, and so something that um, more communities could be thinking of, about um, in, um, creating if it makes sense um, for your community. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to note that in terms of farm-friendly municipal tools, uh, Maine is a home rule state, um, which means that under our state's constitution, um, municipalities can govern themselves and enact laws in any way that is not denied to them by state or federal law. Um, there are lots of different um, tools um, that communities can be thinking about to support the farms um, within their communities. Um, but I also want to emphasize that the tools that communities choose really does depend on the needs and circumstances of those communities and the resources um, that are available. Um, but I did want to highlight three categories of tools that we profile in the guide um, and that um, we hear a lot about or a lot of interest um, from communities about and those are municipal planning and land use tools, municipal, municipal tax program tools, and then promotion and marketing support. Um, and I'm going to give um, a few examples um, in those categories, but again, um, next slide please. Here is the sort of main guide um, that we, Maine Farmland Trust created with American Farmland Trust. Um, and these, the guide, even as it exists today, goes into a lot of detail about different tools that, um, far, that communities can be thinking about. Um, there's a link to this guide within your um, list of resources. Um, but I did want you all to know that we are actively um, uh, in the process of updating that guide. And um, this slide shows some of the areas that we're updating. Um, but we are very interested, and we've heard from some of you on this call, but we're really interested um, in hearing ab about more case studies across Maine, um, about towns that are using different tools and, and sort of town and farmer experiences with those tools. Um, and so if you have um, information that you would like to share, please get in touch with me or um, Abby Farnham. Um, she's just abby at mainefarmlandtrust.org. I'll put that in the chat later on. Um, she is managing our update process, um, and we would really love to hear from you. Okay, next slide. So again, um, this is a really popular area of um, ways that towns have thought about supporting farms, um, you know, comp plans, making sure that comprehensive plans include strong supportive statements about farms and farming, including the range of benefits provided by farms and needed actions and steps to support farms. Um, and I just wanted to note that um, some towns have found that cost of community service studies or economic impact analyses um, have been helpful in terms of building the case for the economic or fiscal benefits of farms within their communities. Um, it's really important to ensure that a town's land use ordinance supports farm operations and protects farmland. That can be done in a number of ways, also profiled within the guide. Um, including special development fees, special use permits for on-farm enterprises, 
um, ensuring you know we're allowing processing facilities and agritourism events, using an agricultural overlay district to allow different standards um, within um, farmland areas. Um, but there really are quite a, a number of them and ways that can be used. Um, and so I, um, and then also just ensuring that our open space plans um, include farmland protection goals and strategies. Um, next slide, please. Um, a lot of towns have um, been interested in municipal tax programs. Um, I wanted to highlight current use taxation programs. Um, these help enrolled landowners reduce their property tax liability. Those are the three types of current use taxation programs within the state and they all have different requirements. Um, but towns can encourage landowners um, to enroll in these programs and can hold info sessions on them with knowledgeable staff um, from the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. Um, and I wanted, with respect to these, I really wanted to note that these programs that are at the center of many discussions happening within the state, including how to promote climate goals through these programs, um, how these programs fit within the discussion of solar siting, and how municipalities and the state can better partner on the expense of these programs so that we're not really um, leaving municipal budgets strapped um, by supporting farms in this way. Um, and then voluntary municipal farm support programs are a couple of towns um, that have adopted these programs. Um, participating farms are granted a 20-year agricultural conservation easement to the town in exchange for full or partial reimbursement of property taxes. And towns develop um, the eligibility requirements for those and determine the amount of property tax relief that can be provided. Um, next slide, please. And so here, um, Julia went over these as well, but there's a really important role um, for farms, I mean, sorry, for communities in helping to market and promote the farms within their communities. Um, those are several different ways um, that are listed, um, but you would be surprised at how just even communities creating directories or guides or just supporting effective signage for farms can really make um, a, distant, a difference. And next slide. And that is all for me. Great. Ellen, thank you so much. That was so exciting and informative. Um, and, you know, we're going to start off next with um, just a, a, some time for some Q&A. Um, if, if you have had some questions mulling about um, in your mind, feel free to, to put them um, into the chat. Um, I'll, I'll tee us up with um, a, a question first for, uh, for Steph Morningstar. Um, we're wondering, Steph, if you can share um, kind of building off of, of what Julia and Ellen have been saying about um, engaging farmers, if you can share uh, any strategies and tools for authentic engagement of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, uh, community members, and farmers um, that, that folks can use. Thanks, Jamie. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to share a resource document into the chat and um, in just a bit. But um, just to go over some high level bullet points about um, how to support Black Indigenous POC farmers and communities regarding food sovereignty and um, land access. There's some simple, yeah, very detailed. And, um, and I think the, the resource guide I'm going to send is about 15 pages long. So we're just going to do a high level bullet point. <laughs> Um, the first is looking at policy. So just thinking about policy that um, focuses on dignity for farm workers, eco economic viability for farmers. Um, obviously, we, we come from a, um, a place of a platform of reparations and um, repair. And so things like uplifting Bill HR 40 is one of those um, sort of heavy hitters as far as reparations is concerned. Um, and then community-based farmer training, so including urban farmers in the USDA farming census and um, ensuring uptake, eliminating the farm service agency, um, county committees, which discriminate against poor and black farmers and funnel funds to local elites with little government or legal oversight, um, fully funding things that nourish our people, so fully funding SNAP and WIC, for example, um, and then obviously um, we have things like um, the Green New Deal. So taking a look at other policy platforms and ideas through the Heal Food Alliance, Farmers and Ranchers for a Green New Deal, National Young Farmers Coalition. And um, I also provided a um, 
some, uh, an open letter to Senator Elizabeth Warren. The second strategy is to um, do simple actions for individuals to end racism in the food system. So things like good food purchasing programs, um, supporting existing community-led work directly by us and for us. We have something called the By Us For Us sort of platform, which is mainly creating programming by Indigenous POC um, for us, so supporting us directly. Um, moving into strategy three, which is the reparations platform that I mentioned before. And um, that's something that uh, right now we have on uh, the NEFO network website, we have a, a reparations map that you can take a look at. And that's a list of about, I would say at this point, 150 land and food-based projects across the, um, the whole of um, the United States that are looking for direct support for reparations. Um, Strategy four is to build alliances and relationships with community. So really list, um, adopting a, a framework of listening and um, as a, if you're a white led organization, really listening and um, instead of doing outreach to POC to convince them to join your initiative, see how you can support them and see how you can build relationships first. So we're always trying to encourage non-extractive, non-transactional relationships with our our organization. So building relationship, getting to know one another, and then for us to share what our, what our needs are and how you can support us. Um, a lot of that actually, especially within um, the sort of up and coming, you know, we're a land trust that just formed and we have a lot of um, similar organizations who are forming now or have um, been, have a foothold in communities. And part of that is about um, actually helping transfer skills and doing technical assistance and, and just understanding what um you know listening and then obviously telling us or helping us with um making sure that we can attain the goals that we've set out through our communities um there's internal organizational transformation and that's the the fifth strategy so that's taking a look at your own organization um really taking a look at you know which territory are you on right so maine is wabanaki and um penobscot territory there's many farmers of color across Maine, but you may or may not know them. Um, so really taking a look at internally at your organization and who you think your communities are, and then actually adjusting that um, based on um, your actual community makeup. And also questioning why there may not be people of color in your community or um, coming out to community related events and things like that. So there's some groups doing um, equity statements that are actually actionable equity statements and not just sort of checking something off of a box or a list. Um, you can take a look at some examples by National Young Farmers Coalition, the Ground Groundswell Center for Local Food and Farming, NESOG, and the National Sustainable Agriculture Commission. Um, these are equity statements that actually have something to back them up, um, actionable ways that the, the organizations are shifting um, to build in equity. And finally, we have strategy six, which is grant making and fundraising. So that's again, um, really centering, um, if you're an organization that's white led and you're looking to uh, receive a grant to serve black indigenous POC community, um, but you don't, you're, you don't have any of those folks on your staff, really question as to who should really be receiving that money. So somebody like NEFO, for example, who's 100% POC led, um, we often lose out to grants to larger white led organizations who are doing the same thing. So there, we receive a much less amount of money and are sometimes a sub awardee, but it doesn't necessarily pay us for um, the value of our time or labor and it doesn't really feed our, our movement at all. Um, so, and then taking a look at self reflection and education, of course, and that, um, we've provided some questions around intersectionality here that you can take a look at. Um, as well as a lot of really great um, vetted recommended reading that is a great place to start out. So that's just a high level bulletproof, uh, bullet, bulletproof, bullet point of um, some of the ways that you can start to dig into this. And on webinar five, we're going to go over these in a little bit more detail along with some of the land access work that we're doing. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Seth, that's great. Um, we have just a couple more minutes for, for Q&A. Um, uh, a question here um, that we have is about, um, I think probably best for you to answer, Ellen, in, in terms of ad comms. I guess we're, we're curious, um, 
why there are so few in Maine. Um, and um, I think only just a couple of them. And so just curious if you had any insight into that and if this is a tool that folks might want to use, um, you know, maybe what have, what have been some of the obstacles to creating agricultural commissions? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think some of it is just um, that it's um, a newer, you know, tool. I mean, Winslow was the first one that created one and that was only in, in uh, 2014. So it just wasn't a common practice. Um, and I, I don't know if I know the reason why, you know, in a state like Massachusetts, it's so much, it's much more common. Um, but I think it's slowly, you know, um, Auburn um, just recently um, created one. So I think it's, um, and, and certainly, you know, that's something that we um, talk to municipalities about. Um, I know that um, Steph Gilbert, at the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry goes around to different communities across the state, um, really sort of encouraging um, communities to be thinking about it. Um, but for whatever reason, it just hasn't been a common practice, but I think something that would be really beneficial moving forward as, as we start to think through, um, you know, creating more farm-friendly policies and, and planning processes. Great, great. Thanks, Ellen. Okay, so I think we're gonna um, move along to our, our next um, uh, exercise, actually a poll real quick that'll kind of tee us up and then I'll introduce the breakout group exercise. Um, so this question is um, sort of just testing how, how you would rank, um, you know, the farm friendliness of uh, the community, either the one that you live in or the one that you work in. Just want to get a self-reflection on that before moving forward. Right, so coming in, and as you're filling that out, I've also just pasted a link in the chat here. Um, this is a is your community farm friendly checklist, which we're going to be using in the next exercise. So if you want to go ahead and open that, um, okay. Megan just closed the poll, and it's looking like um, most people consider the town they work or live in um, a little farm friendly. Um, a couple folks, not at all. Some are say they're getting there, and um, Somebody is also not sure. So that's that's good um, to, to get a sense of, of where you think you're at, because um, that's really going to lead us into this next exercise. Um, so um, basically, in a, in a few moments, um, Megan's going to magically transport us all into a few separate uh, different Zoom rooms uh, called breakout groups. So we're just going to be with a handful of other people. Um, and you're going to have a facilitator in there who's going to orient you to this checklist I just sent to you all in the chat and um, we're all gonna just, when we get in those groups, um, I'm gonna do a quick round of intros and then just take a few minutes quietly to kind of go through that exercise individually. Um, and really just to get a sense of, you know, what are some ideas for what we could be doing in our communities. Um, so our hope for the group is that you get to, um, you know, get off mute, uh, network, share ideas a bit for, you know, things that are working in your community, things you aspire to do in your community. Um, and then really to leave the breakout group with at least one concrete idea of maybe what next step you might take to make the community that you work and live in uh, more farm friendly um, and to, to give you some, some inspiration for that. Um, so without further ado, um, we are all in the next few seconds going to get um, Twilight Zone zapped into another space and you'll, you'll come in on mute. So make sure to um, unmute yourself and um, we'll come back in about 15 minutes. So we'll, we'll see you then. All right, are we all back? It was so hard. I know many of us got cut off in our last few sentences. So sorry there, Clayton. Um, love to follow up with you and, and think through some strategies um, for the farm. But um, I do want to, um, you know, recognize that we are, we're close to time. Um, I hope that exercise was, was really fun for folks. Um, just pulling up. 
um, my notes here. Um, yeah, so I think what, what, what would be nice to do if, if the facilitators from um, the groups would be willing to just share a quick report back of um, kind of some of the high level things that maybe came up um, in the group, maybe some next steps that folks brainstormed. Um, it, it'd be great, great to hear from you. Um, so maybe could we start with uh, breakout group uh, number one? Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, hi oh, everybody. Sorry, that was ours. So thanks, think, yeah, that was us. Um, so I think what emerged, and maybe, you know, tell me if this is what you perceived as well, Jamie, since you were in the group too, but what emerged is that um, both of the communities that we spoke with, both involved in various um, land trust um, or directors, one of we had some advocacy, policy advocacy in there, but really um, not associating their communities with farming was something that really stood out to me in the report. And when I'm reporting back is that, um, you know, both, both folks that we spoke with were saying that there's really jam-packed farmers markets in their communities, but they don't actually associate their communities as farming communities. So um, I find that really interesting in that there's like a lot of interest in farming and a lot of interest in supporting local agriculture, but not necessarily within the bounds of the municipality, um, that those are sort of neighboring farming communities. Um, and yeah, I think as far as next steps, I, part of it was about, um, we were talking about reviewing the comprehensive plans to incorporate agriculture and really getting folks on board with the idea of bringing agriculture into the community. So as far as being farm friendly, I'm not certain that that would be, that those communities are sort of like interested in farming, but still need to sort of think outside the box as far as bringing farms into the community. Great. Thanks, Steph, for that. Um, yeah, the next breakout group, number two, uh, maybe Meg, you want to jump in? I'm not sure if Meg wants to, or I can. This is Willa. I was oh, the facilitator. Willa. Yeah, Willa you. was Meg. the facilitator for that. Yeah. Got okay. it. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so Meg, I was Meg, um, who's the event manager in the Outreach Department at Maine Farmland Trust, and Dave Griswold, who is a retired forester, um, 40 plus years, and now sits on the Auburn Ag Committee. Um, so I think what was really interesting is that looking at the checklist, it was kind of a interesting moment of we weren't really sure about a lot of the answers to the question. So it seemed like a really good place to start um, engaging with a lot of these issues. So I know that David want, was going to bring a copy of this checklist to his next um, ag committee meeting. So that's really great. Um, and then question two, I think the, the next steps um, coming from different communities, I think Meg and I were both in Portland and David is in Auburn. So just looking at the different types of communities and different size communities, you know, Meg and I are in very urban areas. Um, and Auburn is kind of a mix with the downtown core but then a lot of ag land surrounding. So David mentioned that the um, ag committee is basically about to have their second meeting. So they're in the really early stages of their work. So he was really excited about this session and, um, bringing a lot of this information to to the next meeting. So that was kind of one of the big takeaways there. Great, thanks Willa. And last but not least, um, Ellen. Yeah, so we, um, um, Julianne Smith unfortunately was having some, I think, audio issues, um, but it was great to talk with Candace um, when she, who's from the Islesboro Land Trust, and when she was doing the checklist, it really, um, she said sort of drove home for her that there was just sort of a lack of awareness. So she was answering no or thinks no, um, you know, to a lot of the questions, um, realizing that a lot of the promotion is, is driven on the island is driven by farmers themselves or organized by a few neighbors. Um, but there wasn't a ton being done on the municipal level. Um, and so that there could be a really important role for her land trust um, to be helping with with sort of the community think through how they can um, be more supportive. Um, and so her kind of answer of next steps is she really wants, she was really, she felt like she learned a ton from this session and is hoping 
um, to do sort of further research and better understand um, some of the available tools and then just work with the farmers in her community um, and um, the municipal officials to really think through um, policies that would make sense for the island. Great. Great. Well, that was fabulous, y'all. I know we had a, a smaller group today, but I think these conversations were just um, really great and enlivening, and I hope they were um, as inspiring to all of you as they were to me. Um, so I know we're at time, but we just want to take one last minute of your time to kind of do a wrap up. Um, so if you could advance the next slide, uh, Megan. Um, we wanted just to remind you about the um, four remaining workshops in this Farm for the Future series that are coming up over the next month with um, next week is Strategies and Tools for Farm Protection. Um, so if you haven't registered, um, please do so because um, space is filling up and we'd love to have you back. Uh, next slide. And, and we just wanna really give a, a very special um, thanks to today's presenters for taking the time to come out and, and share their knowledge and wisdom to, to Julia, Steph, and Ellen. Like I said, super uh, dynamite powerhouse uh, leaders in this space. And we're just really, really grateful to have you with us. So, so thank you. Um, and then just a, a quick note that um, after today, um, probably by the end of the day or tomorrow, you'll just get a follow-up um, email from us um, asking you to take a very brief survey about your experience today. Um, and we really hope um, you'll take the time to fill it out. It'll help us improve the workshop um, for the future, as well as um, enable us to better follow up with you about any resources you might need. So we just want to thank you in advance for, for taking a few minutes um, to do that. And in that email, we'll also include um, the recording um, from today, a resource handout, anything else that we can think of that um, we think you might want. So just to wrap up by saying, you know, thanks again for being here with us today. Um, we invite you to follow up um, with any questions you have. We're happy to connect you to any resources. And um, we hope to see you next week at the Farmland Protection Workshop. So have a great day. Stay safe, everybody. And um, we're so grateful for you. Best of luck.